Welcome to another in our series of webinars uh, produced by the World Affairs Council. I'm Ray Suarez. I'm the host of World Affairs, or one of the co-hosts of World Affairs, the podcast produced by the Council and aired on KQED-FM and public radio stations across the country. Today, we welcome John Ferris, author of Behind the Enigma, the authorized history of GCHQ, Britain's secret cyber intelligence agency. Say the word spy to somebody, and they'll conjure up furtive meetings in exotic locales, drops of stolen material, handoffs in public parks, high power binoculars, and when all else fails, violence, assassinations, explosions, poisonings. My guest would remind you there's so much more to finding things out than all of that pop culture stuff. In the move from a world where information existed purely in physical form, and the challenge was seeing it, noting it, and telling the people who need to know, and armies on the march? Well, how many people? How are they armed? Where are they heading? A fleet has set off? Well, where did they go? In a world without telephones, airplanes, radar, internet, and at least at the beginning, even telegraph, finding things out and telling the people who need to know what you know was hard. And your enemies were spending every second trying to hide what they know and find out what you know. Now, vast, immeasurable rivers of information fly through the air, through impulses, moving through wires at the speed of light. And the journey from the world of leather pouches and handwritten dispatches to satellites, high-speed encryption, and as ever, staying one step ahead of the competition is the subject of my guest's exhaustive study. John Ferris is the author of Behind the Enigma, the authorized history of GCHQ, Britain's secret cyber intelligence agency. John Ferris, great to have you with us. Glad to be here. Professor, it's a fascinating history that takes us from debates over the ethics of opening other people's mail all the way to the age of airplanes that can fly over a coastline and scoop up millions of cell phone calls. Did you realize it was going to need a desk-sized 850-page monster of a tale to tell? Did you realize all along what you were getting into? I didn't think it was going to be as long as it became. I thought that it would be around 700 pages. But as it went on, it got bigger. And both GCHQ and the publishers, Bloomsbury, were willing to live with it. So there you go. A mammoth undertaking, indeed. And uh, you are, in effect, the authorized biographer of GCHQ. Yep. They opened a lot of things to you. It must have been quite complicated setting the ground rules at the beginning for what you could see and what you could talk about and what you couldn't. Essentially, we were able to come to a set of agreements that I was happy with, and they were happy with. Um, they gave me access to their main files on policy, their internal histories, a lot on their administration, and essentially everything on a number of specific campaigns. So the Falklands conflict, for example. And also everything up until August 1945 was open anyway. What they didn't want me to talk about, I understood. They didn't want me to talk about diplomatic code breaking after 1945 because it would be embarrassing to both sides. Um, they didn't want me to talk about any techniques that were currently applicable, which I agreed with 100%. And finally, there's something called equities. Every intelligence agency that, that's involved with others that are friendly um, maintains the ability to control how it's presented in any publication by the other. So any agency GCHQ worked with had the right to write themselves out of my book, which some of them did. Now the key here is NSA, American, the National Security Agency, the American equivalent of GCHQ. They and GCHQ work together extremely closely on most of what they do. And I could not have written the book at all had NSA not been willing to be generous. And they were. They, Did I, you have to go through a, a separate process to get the National Security Agency of the United States to sign off on things that 
the British had already said, we'll go ahead? Well, first of all, there was a meeting in NSA between myself, the British GCHQ historian, Rick Ledgett, who was then the deputy director of NSA, and senior NSA officials, where essentially they agreed that yes, they would support the idea of the book. After the book was written, all the chapters had to go through the normal process of pre-publication clearance, which NSA does for any of its own publications. And NSA was remarkably generous. Essentially, they made us the number one priority for their pre-pub clearance. And they also didn't take hold much back. The, there are things I'd say in the later Cold War where a combination of equities, you know, technical issues that are still alive meant that there was a big reduction in my drafts. But essentially I would say that NSA was pretty generous and GCHQ lived up to its word entirely. In fact, what happened in the course of writing is that originally we'd end, intended to end the book at the end of the Cold War. But as time went by, we all agreed that we should actually try to take it forward to the present day. And so in fact, there's a very long last chapter which takes GCHQ from the Cold War to the present day, which talks about how it evolves into being the first SIGINT agency that was able to live on the internet and how it then became a public organization which is involved in giving advice to normal British civilians and businesses about how to protect themselves in the cyber world we live in today. So the last chapter actually is the one which I personally think is the most important for people to read because essentially what it does is take the history and then take you to where we are today. Literally. SIGINT, Signals Intelligence, um, conjures up a world of um, semaphore and Morse code and flags and flashing light decks, but that stays with us from the 19th century till today. Well, really, SIGINT in its real modern form begins in the First World War. It begins actually the first week of the First World War, but it had been practiced in parts beforehand. So you could intercept semaphore traffic. You could intercept telegraph traffic. And in the American Civil War, both sides are occasionally tapping the other side's uh, normal civilian telegraph cables in order to get material. But it's not until 1914 that with radio, you're able to get a constant supply of the enemy's traffic enough that you can actually process it and either break encryption or do what's called traffic analysis, which is an equally important technique, which essentially looks at the external features of communications and says who is talking to who. And by the way, if you're looking at the basis of um, modern SIGINT today, which works against bulk, against bulk collection, traffic analysis is actually the, the first thing you do. And it's only after traffic analysis has done its job that you can try to bring cryptanalysis into the equation. And from the moment the First World War begins, these things become possible. Everybody starts to do it all of a sudden. And once you start getting the material, no government wants to give it up because it becomes apparent just how valuable the tool is. Government Communication Headquarters, GCHQ, tracks right along with Britain as it moves from an enormous, powerful, globe-straddling empire to a mid-sized power looking for a role in a transformational 21st century. How did Britain, how does Britain, remain a power in the espionage game? How does it continue to punch above its weight? There's no question that it does. Um, I think that every analyst would agree that the British are in the very top group of espionage powers. And I think that when we're dealing with SIGINT, there are only five countries that really matter today, and Britain is one of them. The US is another. Um, China, Russia, and Israel, strangely enough, um, for the uninitiated. Nobody else is in their league. And I'd say the British are as good as anyone. 
Um, how do they do it? You know, there's a kind of British cultural issue involved here. The links between British academics and government are close. For whatever reason, the British have been able to maintain a position at the top of the world in terms of any form of cryptanalysis. And NSA actually more or less says that it's only peer in the world in cryptanalysis or crypto mathematics as they call it today, by the Brits. Um, so this, in essence, the, the British culturally are able to generate people who do intelligence well, and their system is set up so that people who collect intelligence are taken seriously and their product is taken seriously. Now the American system normally does that too, although I'm not certain it's quite worked that way in the past few years. But because the British system is smaller, it's actually easier for the British to unify their effort. Whereas because the Americans are so big, it's actually really hard to coordinate things. And so the combination of the British and Americans means that you're bringing together very different powers and skills and harnessing them together. And what I find British and American SIG enters constantly doing is saying, well, two eyes are better than one. That is always the phrase that comes up when I ask them about the relationship. So what it really means is that since 1942, um, British and American code breakers have worked more closely with each other than they have worked with anyone in their own governments. And their own governments have tolerated that because they say that in professional terms, it works. And if we had to um, create a kind of treaty that would allow this to happen, we're not sure that our population would ever allow it. One of the reasons Zucuza was kept hidden after 1945 is that American authorities were afraid that if Americans knew about it, they would think that it was a bad idea and stop it from happening. And so, the, the reason why it remained hidden until really about 30 years after it was created was out of fear that the publics wouldn't like what was being done. The American public would like what was being done. But in fact, what I would argue is that GCHQ is one of the United States' best allies. And it's done a great deal for your security in ways that you don't know without costing you very much. You use that term, Yakuza, that's UK-USA. It's yes. the, the two-headed uh, uh, intelligence effort. Uh, secrets, especially big secrets, and this occurred to me again, are a fun thing. They're like a volatile chemical. They're powerful. They're maybe even a little tricky to handle for trained people, but harder and harder to control as the circle of people privy to them expands. Time and again in your story, there's a kind of tension uh, around calibrating the value of information to the number of eyes that can actually see it. Keeping things secret is hard. Absolutely. It's an extremely difficult thing to do. And the process of making yourself that secret really affects the individual psychology of SIG enters and also the way SIG and agencies are organized. In the period after the Second World War, all of the Five Eyes SIGINT agencies, and that includes Canada, and, and define that Five Eyes before you go on. Five Eyes, which comes from essentially, you have products that are for American eyes only or British eyes only. Well, there's a category that is for the eyes of Australians, Canadians, British, Americans, New Zealanders. So that's where Five Eyes comes from. So although the core is Anglo-American, and of course the most important partner is the United States from about 1960, it really is a, an Anglosphere form of cooperation because there's a greater willingness to trust each other than there is to trust any other Western country. Now what this focus on secrecy does is of course affect the way individual SIG enters behave and the way the organizations behave. They're fixated on secrecy in ways which we find nowadays really hard to imagine. So in the middle 1960s, when the pioneering SIGINT historian David Kahn 
published the first really serious study in code breaking called the Code Breakers. Um, the British and Americans were horrified. They believed that David Kahn was threatening national security. And <laughs> they really were trying in an ideal world to prevent him from publishing at all. But the mere idea that anyone would mention NSA or GCHQ horrified them. Once it became clear around 1970 that the ultra story was going to come out because Poles and French people who were involved in the earlier stages were publishing about it. Then the British and Americans decided, well, we're going to have to have a kind of controlled release. But they were deeply uncomfortable with any kind of open recognition until after the Cold War. It's really only- And remind people what ultra is? Ultra is the term the Allies use for high-grade SIGINT against the codes of the Axis powers. So whether it comes from a code book or whether it comes from a cryptographic machine, ultra essentially is the highest category of intelligence that there is. And so when you read about Alan Turing or Bletchley Park attacking German crypto machines called Enigma, well, that's one part of ultra, although there are many other parts. There are code words to cover that sort of thing that go on into the Cold War. Uh, you'd be amazed how many code words there are that are applied to SIGINT because there are so many different categories of it. And very, very few people are entitled to see it all. Even if you work for GCHQ or NSA, internally, you may not, in fact, you probably won't have access to certain categories of material unless you can explain why. Now, SIGINTERS individually become obsessed with secrecy. And the organizations really are so focused on secrecy that they find it hard to come to terms with the age of publicity. And for both GCHQ and NSA, in the late Cold War and up to the present day, coming to terms with how open you need to be and can afford to be are major issues. Now, I don't use the word transparency. I use the word translucency, which was coined by a retired American NSA uh, official named Dave Sherman, um, because you can't make a second agency transparent. If you do, you're giving up all your secrets to your competitors. But you need to provide enough material that your public can understand what you're doing and why. And you do that both because it's constitutionally necessary, because your society will no longer tolerate people completely operating in the secret. And frankly, finally, because if you don't do that, you're going to be uh, portrayed as being, you know, a bunch of monsters behind the scenes trying to read everybody's mail, manipulating the world. So they've been driven oh. rather against their will into a fair degree of openness. And I would actually say that we're now at the stage where we can talk about history all the way through the Cold War, history of, Cold, of SIGINT all the way through the Cold War with a lot of certainty. And frankly, so much has been leaked in the past five or 10 years that I could reconstruct the history of SIGINT since 1992 when it's turned into cyber intelligence simply from things that are in open sources. It's actually now something that people can talk about and study openly. Well, you mentioned um, secrecy in a democracy. The public, after all, is being asked to pay for all this. And the politicians, even if they don't support telling the public everything, they insist on knowing what yeah. they're paying for after a point. Oh, absolutely. And there's always that tension, even tension internationally and between services. So if army intelligence generates something, Navy yeah. intelligence wants it and on and on and on. And yet everybody's interested in holding on to the wonderful goodies they uncover. Well, I'm a big believer in, in real operational security. I believe that the agencies have a duty, just like the military does. And you have to be, to a, at a certain point, in the modern world, you have to be willing to trust to organizations to be honest and honorable. At the same time, you have to know enough about them to be able to be sure. 
that they're honest and honorable. Um, from our point of view, the dilemma with SIGINT is that if it's turned against us by our government, then there is real reason to worry. And I've been, aw I've been aware of that issue ever since I started studying SIGINT, which is actually around 1980, when as a graduate student, I was stumbling across material that wasn't supposed to be in the files. And what I'd say is that up until the end of the Cold War, GCHQ and NSA, i.e. the major Western, and I emphasize Western, SIGINT agencies, did not intercept the communications of their own citizens. If they did, it was accidental, and as a gener almost as a universal rule, they didn't want anything to do with it. However, organizations like MI5 or the FBI could use SIGINT on their own in terms of investigations at home in different ways. What has changed and what really creates complications is the fact that communications are now in the world all carried by roughly the same media. So telephone lines carrying internet traffic, aligned with satellite communications, aligned with fiber optics. Um, and you no longer really have these dedicated systems like high frequency radio, which are only used by military services. Now on top of that, the nature of the internet means that any communication between two people or 50 is rooted through the cheapest means possible, which means that our communications between us might now being, be rooted through Beijing. Just as if Russian intelligence in Petersburg is communicating with Russian intelligence in Moscow, that traffic might be rooted through London. So the old division, which is pretty straightforward between internal communications, which our SIGINT agencies couldn't touch, and external communications, which our SIGINT agencies were free to attack, has broken down. Now beyond that, the mode of collection that exists today is bulk collection. And what bulk collection essentially means is that you vacuum up for a limited period of time a huge amount of traffic. I mean, there are so many billions of telecommunication events in the world every day that I couldn't number them. But bulk, bulk collection means that you can collect several billion communications every day. You can't keep them for long. You have to flush them out of your system because if you keep them there, you can't add anything new. And what you're able to do in the West is to essentially reduce these communications to a, a very small number of data points, like IP addresses. Now, what I, one director of GCHQ said to me, in fact, I, I put it in the book, but not associating him with it, um, is that if you imagine that all the world's communications are a billiards table, then the amount of communications which we can collect are a beer mats worth of material. And the material that we can touch or process in the most basic way is a full stop or a um, you know, period at the end of a sentence. And I can also tell you that if you then say, how many of those messages can you actually read? Well, we're probably going through the same process again. So every day, the five eyes have the ability to look at the external features of billions of communications. They probably have the ability to read thousands or maybe tens of thousands of communication systems, i.e. you've encrypted anything that I'm, or you've broken the encryption on anything I said. And what that means is that essentially, if you do the math, their ability to actually get anything out of most of the material that they collect is extremely limited. And that's why I'm personally not worried about it. Because in fact, they can barely handle the real targets they're after. And their real targets are as ever foreign governments which are hostile, foreign governments which are neutral, because in the world of politics, um, there are very few friends, and neutrals are very often not particularly friendly. Um, GCHQ and NSA go after cyber terrorists, they go after foreign intelligence, 
And the likelihood that they go after you or me, I'd say, is extremely tiny. We can control that through law. And I'm a firm, I, my, is it, if anything has changed, my mind's been changed by anything in the course of my research into SIGINT. It's that in Western countries, law really matters when you are dealing with what SIGINT agencies can and can't do. You need a proper enforced legal system that will prevent the guardians from becoming a problem to us. But my own experience with Western SIGINT, and above all else, the five R's, is that they try to be lawful. And they're afraid of the consequences of being unlawful. On the other hand, if they're free to attack a target, they are techno geeks. They will go out voraciously, go after any target that they're allowed to go after. And trust me, they are good and very, very formidable. So as people watch machines become more and more powerful, their ability to scoop and snoop uh, becoming more formidable by the day, um, if somebody at home listening to this conversation is thinking, are they watching me? Uh, the answer you're saying, it seems to be, is probably not. Well, the answer is an Israeli um, term, which is called yes, no and yes. Um, undoubtedly, some of your communications are caught up on one day or another in these billions of communications that are temporarily held and then expelled. But the odds of them actually ever having the ability to know that they've intercepted any of your communications are extremely low. And above all else, the limit is the human factor. Once human analysis is involved and any processing, whether it's traffic analysis, i.e. looking at what one IP um, address is, is doing in terms of its communications with others. Down to crypt analysis is all human. Now, in effect, the weird thing is that our, we are much more likely to be surveyed by uh, the internet providers we work with. You know, if you think about cookies appearing on your system, it goes to show who's monitoring what you're doing. Um, and businesses. Commodifying data means that businesses have much more of a reason to go after our communications than our government agencies do, as long as we keep the government agencies under proper legal control. I'm much more worried about proper legal control over organizations like um, FBI, MI5, the Canadian equivalent, than I am over NSA and GCHQ, because in the end, NSA and GCHQ really don't care about us. Whereas internal security services have to care more about us than um, SIGINT, traditional SIGINT agencies do. But I will say again, as an historian, I have been surprised by how effective law has been in restraining the actions of Western SIGINT agencies. It does not work that way in France, and it does not work that way in the PRC or Russia or many other countries like in May. Back to GCHQ, the story is fascinating in part because of the menagerie of characters you throw up over time. And they each in their different definitions have a role to play in making this agency what it is and what it was. Soldiers, engineers, linguists, mathematicians, bureaucrats, and politicians, sometimes working at cross purposes, sometimes working in beautiful synchronicity, um, sometimes uh, mutually unintelligible, but somehow it all gets done. Well, Siginters, as one friend of mine said, like to work in teams. Um, if you're dealing with human intelligence, in a lot of cases, what you're really looking for are individuals with very pronounced individual skills who like being on their own. But Sikinters want to work in teams. Now, from almost the very beginning, like a few months into the First World War, you see emerging a team of teams, which goes on until today. 
you have people who collect traffic by whatever means, whether it is radio, telegraph, or whether it's the internet today. You have data processes. Um, people who organize the data into ways that makes it accessible. And that changes all the time too. Um, when, if you go back to 1914, we're talking about the file index, card index system, which actually works really well. Uh, I'm astounded, in fact, by how well good card index systems can handle millions of communications, even in, let's say, 1915-16. You have to have intelligence officers, people who are able to say, all right, you've given me this product, so what? And finally, and most scarce of all, you need to find people who can break encryption. And although all of these groups of people are necessary, the code breakers are in the end the key to what makes SIGINT different. And what they do takes different forms. I mean, back in the early part of the 20th century, you need people who are able to simply look at a table filled with sheets of paper with numbers grouped in five numerals. And after they go over that, suddenly say, wait a minute, I can see duplications here. Wow, I can see in fact, that somebody has repeated a message erroneously, which means that I now can compare, let's say 25 group values with another 25 group values. And I know they're referring to the same thing. Um, that ability is truly astounding. That's something I don't have but it becomes mathematized increasingly from well, 1940. And what Bletchley Park does is in effect revolutionize SIGINT because it mathematizes and mechanizes the process of signals intelligence. Now, Alan Turing conceptualizes the idea of the computer in 1935. By 1944, the British have created the first reprogrammable computers and are using it to attack German crypto machines. When you think about it historically, that's a genuinely astounding thing to have had happen. And at the same time, once you're dealing with machines which can essentially make encryption far more powerful than it's been before, you're forced into making mathematics the basis of what you're doing. And so in effect, by the end of the Second World War, Bletchley has created a computer and it has created modern crypto mathematics. And part of the reason why Bletchley, why GCHQ remains so powerful in crypt is because it learned the lessons from Alan Turing and others. You know, if you're, if you're looking for a father figure, to set you on a path to cryptanalysis. I'd say that Alan Turing is a pretty good person to be following. Now, NSA carries on that tradition. And in fact, when it comes to creating computers, NSA really is historically very, very important. From oh, 1950 to 1980, I'd say NSA is almost the driving force in the development of the computer. Not quite, but very close to it. And so in essence, the basis for the computer, for much of the way the world operates comes from two SIGINT agencies. And we don't really fully understand exactly how it is that these secret organizations create the basis for our public communications. I, if I recall correctly, um, you even mention in the book that sort of the stereotype that grows up in the British-American relationship is that the U.S. is sort of great with hardware and throwing a lot of money on its development, and uh, the British are good on the find-me-the-right-person side, um, creative intelligence, let's say, uh, and that together those make a pretty formidable combination. Let me also say that the British have lots of resources and the Americans have lots of brains. But one director of GCHQ, after, that was in the early 2000s, jokingly on BBC said, they have the money, we have the brains, it's a great combination. 
And certainly there is something to that. Um, where the British have been at their best is when you set these problem solving, slightly crazy, obsessive people free to track down a problem they're interested in. And this, in, in the Cold War and earlier, this was called general search. There were other terms that were used to it. So in other words, you're basically saying to these guys, go out and find something new. And they want to, that's what these people like. So the more you free these people to do, in essence, in a weird way, academic research in communications networks, the more they're likely to do or find new things that nobody knows. So in a way, that kind of approach is like applied science. And the British are pretty good at it. I mean, I think the, the historical record that I've seen, certainly up until the late Cold War indicates that the British actually do more than their share of finding new things to go after. And that also, I think, clearly happens after the Cold War. When GCHQ is transformed into an organization that can operate on the internet five to 10 years ahead of NSA. And what that means, again, is that the British are pioneering ways to operate and collect. And if you go through all the leaked material, and there's a huge amount of it, and focus on the NSA GCHQ relationship from, well, let's say, the late 90s until 2013, clearly the British are still leading more than one would expect, given their numbers, in technical areas on the internet. And the Americans are very appreciative of what the British are doing. Now, of course, there are lots of good people in the world. The Israelis are very good. Um, NSA is an organization that should never be underestimated. It's one of the most effective and formidable organizations the United States has. And I think very few Americans appreciate just how much NSA does. But nonetheless, GCHQ remains unusually formidable. And it's the, the individual level where they're at their strongest. The, we're introduced as readers to a, a tremendous number of interesting characters. Um, tinkerers, um, obsessives, as you, as you mentioned, um, people uh, generated by the British education system, but also there are realities about Britain, certainly from the 19th and 20th century, that when you layer on sexism, classism, racism, religious exclusion even, it took some time for Britain to identify and trust, for instance, the value of women, of people who went to university in places other than Oxford and Cambridge, and non-whites, even in an empire filled with hundreds of millions of non-white people whose help you needed to keep an eye on what was going on in the Far East, in India, in Africa. Uh, did Britain, in effect, retard its own development by these old-fashioned and outmoded notions of who was good at what? Yes, but not necessarily to a fatal degree. I spent a lot of time on those issues because I think they're very important. And they're also important to modern-day GCHQ, issues of diversity. And I'm quite certain that there will be lots of talk going on in GCHQ, looking at material I've dug up about what happens with women or non-white minorities. What I would say is that compared to other British security, intelligence, and defense organizations, GCHQ always is more progressive on issues of diversity than anyone else. So for example, in the late uh, 20th century, they were the first British organization to essentially say, we're no longer going to regard homosexuality as being an impediment to someone's employment as long as the people never work outside of Great Britain. Um, and in fact, I, you know, the United States government has a 
very active campaign from the early 50s onward to expose gays in the American civil service and to remove them. The British don't do that. They're, the British actually have a, a high focus on privacy. And so they're very reluctant to inquire about people's um, gender identification. If somebody is found, well, they'll be fired. But you know, Alan Turing, for example, was uncovered as a gay because of his own behavior, unfortunately, in the early 1950s. Um, GCHQ had a number of people who knew he was gay. They didn't care. It was and still a crime on the books in Britain at that time. Absolutely. It was a crime and GCHQ could have done nothing to help him. But nonetheless, the head of GCHQ's code-breaking organization, who was a, a student of Turing, gave the most important judicial testimony in favor of Turing saying, although I can't tell you the details, this man did great work for Britain during the Second World War, and that should count for something in your judgment. But nonetheless, in the issue of gays, not bad. Issue of women, it's really complicated in the sense that actually, up until 1940, GCHQ is willing to hire women in the highest status positions possible. And by the way, so are the American SIGINT agencies at the same time. There are a number of women in the 1930s in Britain and the United States who are leading signatures. Emily Anderson is the most obvious one in Britain, who for a few years actually essentially runs the most important section in GCHQ, which is attacking Italian diplomatic traffic. But after the Second World War, there is no question that women moved down the ranks in, in GCHQ. There is no woman who is a senior figure. They are integrated in intelligence analysis up to an important degree, far more than in any other British organization. But essentially they're put into a pink ghetto. Whereas working class men actually have an unusual opportunity in GCHQ during the Cold War to rise. The British simply, because the British educate so much a smaller proportion of their population than Americans or Canadians do. They're driven to employ people who leave school at age 16. And in essence, a lot of working class boys end up rising to middle management or senior management at GCHQ because there's room to move. And GCHQ actually spends a lot of attention trying to help their careers. Finally, when we get to non-white people, it's a really complicated issue. And there is no question whatsoever that GCHQ absolutely follows the norm of British government departments after 1945, which is to not allow non-white people into defense or security organizations. The United States is much more progressive on those issues than the British are um, for a lot of reasons. But in, nonetheless, the British don't really until the 1980s allow non-white people into mainstream elements of British intelligence or security. So strangely enough, one of the things I've mentioned briefly is that if you look at NSA, NSA actually is far more progressive in employing women and allowing them to reach the top than any other organization in the world. And it also has a pretty reasonable record of promoting and employing um, African-Americans. And they're much more progressive than GCHQ is in those areas. And I'd argue that that's simply because of different institutional factors in the United States. Nonetheless, GCHQ is sort of a mixed bag of a background here. But if you look at it in historical context, it's more progressive than usual. Not because GCHQ people are socially more liberal, but because the job requires it. In the end, you need people with certain mental characteristics. And if they're a woman, or if they're Jewish, or if they are Asian, well, if they can do the job and you can't find anyone else, boy, you're going to bring them on board. If any member of our audience has questions for John Ferris, please send them along in the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. 
I'd love to put them to the professor. Uh, one question that I had to ask myself after a certain point, once Britain was no longer an imperial power, certainly once it was a member of the EU, uh, was safely under the NATO defensive umbrella after 1952, what is GCHQ for? And were there politicians inside Britain asking that same question? Who are our enemies in a world where we no longer have a far-flung empire to protect, when we are part of um, defense and diplomatic alliances where we have collective security? We aren't a superpower like we used to be, yet we have this superpower-style snooping agency. Why? The reason is because Britain still wants to retain real importance in the Western alliance systems. And the British actually do so in part by keeping large military forces. They decline in strength over time, but nonetheless, they remain large and formidable. GCHQ is a cheap date. You don't have to spend a huge amount of money on GCHQ in order to keep it at the top of the league. And the British actually define a policy which says we will keep GCHQ up to the level of quality which the Americans demand in order for us to be kept at the high table. Because if GCHQ is taken really seriously by the Americans, that in turn enables us to get more influence from our other um, investments in defense than the British, uh, than the American, uh, we do not otherwise. Now, by the way, since the Cold War, that argument no longer is maintained. And although, in fact, to some degree, GCHQ people are always a bit nervous when they compare themselves to the Americans, they keep, the British government keeps up GCHQ now for national reasons rather than for building influence in DC. So that was essentially the reason. You could actually use the money you might need to pay the main, to pay to build a new warship, one new warship, and you could use that to keep up GCHQ to a point where the Americans said, you're contributing something that's really important. So it was a, a rational cost investment. I can also tell you that from the mid 70s when the British are really scraping uh, economies out of their system, GCHQ is being economized, and nothing changes until the Falklands conflict. And when the Falklands conflict happens, GCHQ saves Britain's bacon. It saves Mrs. Thatcher's government. Without GCHQ, the British could not have reconquered the Falklands. And after that, I guarantee that Mrs. Thatcher ensures that GCHQ receives much more money than it had done before. But yes, it's a, a, it's a rational strategy. And GCHQ ultimately becomes, I would say, probably the number one British priority in strat strategic institutions, largely because it's a cheap investment. Let's go to our questioners. Joshua wants to know, European intelligence seems to focus on the Russia threat, including cyber. What is the GCHQ perspective on Chinese cyber? Oh, the, G the GCHQ is very close to NSA in terms of its views on this issue. For what it's worth, without betraying any secrets, the Anglo-American SIGINT people really regard the Chinese as being the number one problem not necessarily a threat. Um, they see the Russians as much more opportunistic, out for money, fragmented, which of course probably is true. They see the Chinese as actually having a centralized process of collection, which is linked to a rational strategy. Having said that, my, my sense, and this is based entirely without any classified knowledge, my sense is that GCHQ actually tends to be the leader in the Five Eyes in terms of dealing with the Russians. And my sense is that probably NSA is more the leader in dealing with the Chinese. But essentially, the main threat that the Five Eyes see is Chinese and Russian. And indeed, nowadays, we see the Chinese as being far more aggressive. 
correctly. They are. Sherry would like to know, what are your thoughts regarding Russian theft of Five Eyes cybersecurity tools? Well, I'm... Uh, or is it Fire Eyes cybersecurity tools? Five, uh, well, actually, it could be the Fire Eyes thing. Um, the Russians have been involved with some success in going after American, including NSA, techniques. How it has happened, I don't know, but I would say that although I admire NSA, the past decade has given me some reason to wonder about its security. What I would say is that you should assume every day that the Russians are out to be as difficult for us as they can. They're fighting an active cyber war. And although they are losing, from what I can see, more than they are winning, they have actually done quite well in getting access to American, both CIA and NSA, techniques for collecting signals intelligence. And they're gonna go on doing it. They will not stop. We cannot control it. Um, unfortunately, you know, unilateral digital disarmament is not going to make that problem go away. Do you think the US power grid is vulnerable to attack as Russia did to Ukraine? The answer is yes, but I mean that this is, and I'm actually I'm giving you the answer that I think is conventional among strategists. Yes, indeed, it is possible for any major industrialized country to have its power grid or any number of elements of critical infrastructure knocked out. But I can also tell you that if that happens to anybody, boy, they're going to be angry. And for what it's worth also, most analysts believe that cyber war is never going to be conducted on its own. It's only going to be conducted as part of something that involves kinetic activities as well. But to a frightening degree, all modern advanced economies rely on absolutely purely digitized control systems, all of which are vulnerable to cyber attack. Is power in its conventional, in the way we conventionally think of it, just not as useful in the 21st century as it might have been? Uh, you know, the missile gap was one of the obsessions of the 1960 campaign. Um, defense intellectuals argued about throw weight, and uh, people who grew up in the 1960s learned about the Fulda Gap and uh, the Soviets roaring across Eastern Europe with their unnumbered tanks. Um, that kind of stuff may not, doesn't seem like that's going to tell the story of the 21st century. Maybe the information guys and the gearheads are really some of the most powerful actors. Well, I'm a military historian as well as an intelligence historian, and what you said is absolutely true. My only caveat would be to say that simply because things right now look that way, doesn't mean that they will stay that way, say, 50 years from now. But what is clear in the past 40 years is that we've seen a radical decline in the size of military forces, in the size of old-fashioned conventional forces. We have seen instead a massive investment in special forces, um, strike forces, by which I mean, for example, UAVs, which are often commonly called drones, and SIGIN. There is no question, I mean, the, the figure I use, which in fact I think is pretty indicative, is that in 1938, the Royal Navy has 200,000 personnel and everybody involved in British SIGINT is around 1,000 people. If you look at the present day, it's about a four to one ratio. So in effect, there is far more influence, far more significance paid to cyber forces, and SIGINT than, than there is to old-fashioned conventional forces. And cyber is no longer just a form of intelligence. Although Western organizations are trying to figure out the relationship between cyber and military forces, and trust me, it's not simple to do. 
what is clear is that cyber has become a kind of kinetic tool. It is a form of force. And in current British strategic doctrine, GCHQ is the organization which is solely in charge of British security in one of the four vital areas they define. And GCHQ is also involved in every other one. And if you look at NSA, I tell you, I'll tell you the same thing. In the United States, it is also a conventional military force in a way like the United States Air Force as much as it is an intelligence agency. Joshua asks, what is the degree of joint operations involving GCHQ and SIS, which I guess is part of British intelligence? Right? SIS is, is the MI6 or secret intelligence service. The answer is that I was steered, steered away from any kind of research into the area. What I would say is that SIS and GCHQ actually have surprisingly good relations. They were the same organization from the middle 1920s until 1942, and they have learned to cooperate with each other. So whereas relations between CIA and NSA often have been unpleasant, SIS and GCHQ have worked together a lot. Now, when we're dealing with the current counter-terrorist threat in every country, you're finding much closer involvement between SIGINT agencies and security agencies and also human intelligence agencies. But you would find that you get more material from unclassified sources than I ever saw from anything unclassified material. So although I believe that you're on the right track, I can't really give you very much evidence on it. We never uh, discussed, I guess, the junior partners of Five Eyes. So maybe we could go out with that. Sure. Um, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, not only because of their cultural closeness and their historic connections to Britain, but also because they are located in places that are very important to understanding the flow of goods and forces around the world, um, I guess geography and culture make them um, still worthwhile and important partners to have. I would say so, but I'm a Canadian and I'm bound to have you know, different opinions than Americans do. Um, in the Cold War, the Australians, the Kiwis and us were all niche players. And so that meant, for example, that the Australians focused on Indonesia and the Chinese. We Canadians focused on the Arctic, which made sense. Um, you get a lot of material on the Russians that way. Since the end of the Cold War, we've had to adjust. My own sense, for example, is the Canadians have become somewhat more adventurous than they were before. But you gain more from them than you know. I mean, the basic rule of thumb in the Five Eyes is you can only eat from the pot if you contribute to the pot. And I would say that the Canadians and Australians, both in different ways, have ensured that they're providing unique material to the pot, which keeps the Americans and British happy. The Kiwis are in a different position. I mean, they don't contribute a huge amount, but we're happy to have them on board. You'd be surprised at the affection there is to, toward New Zealanders on the part of British and American signatures. So that does have some weight in keeping them on board. But what I would say is that actually the Five Eyes are the most important and most powerful intelligence alliance in the world. If, you, if the Americans were to walk away from the Five Eyes tomorrow, you would have to increase the, your scale of investment in SIGINT by maybe 30 to 40 percent in order to make up for the loss. And it would take a long time before you were back to that level of quality. And I have to say, given the unpleasant nature of the world, I think that we are all better off cooperating than splitting up. Although I can also tell you lots of British and American SIGINTers don't know or don't believe that Ukusa is going to last more than another generation. Well, Professor Th Ferris, we have to leave it there, but thank you very much for joining us. We're delighted you could be with us today. I'm glad to be here. Take care.
To those of you who listened in today, thank you. We hope you enjoyed the program. Please join World Affairs next Tuesday, December 15th at noon Pacific for a program with political journalists, Peter Baker and Susan Glasser on the life and legacy of one of the great power brokers in Washington, James Baker. You can RSVP on our website. Thanks to people who joined us with the questioning. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm Ray Suarez.